they can look for the customers. The person who puts their money is contracting. They would like to buy these seaweed uh, sushi business, sushi products. Then this SME have customers for the next three years. So they are purchasing these products by putting their money up front. Then SME is very sure they can get their money and also they can find already their customers for next three years. This is another example of wine, Western style, style wine of Japanese agriculture farmers. Left hand side is the beans which were created by, again, a new startup uh, farmers. And the bottom on the left is a Vietnam case. About uh, 30, 40 ladies are raising money by these hometown investment trust funds. And lastly, money lenders. In many small businesses cannot go borrowing for banks, so they go to pawn shops and money lenders. Japan used to set up 96% of interest rate by those money lenders. So many small businesses were indebted, accumulated their uh, default losses. So we tried to incorporate those money lenders into the umbrella of financial regulation. And first one, and the bottom number three, interest rate they can charge highest is 20%. And people cannot borrow money more than one third of their income or one third of their sales. And we have also created a minimum capital requirement for money lenders. And this new uh, law and uh, new effort has made money lenders market became under the umbrella of financial regulation. And I hope all these uh, experiences of Japan can be applied to not only India, but also for other South Asian countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ishuno. You have made my task uh, very easy by finishing uh, in 15 minutes. Uh, the uh, third speaker on the list is Mr. Anil Bhardwaj, who is Secretary General of the Federation of Indian Micro and Small and Medium Enterprises for close to 20 years. As a functionary of the FISME, Mr. Bhardwaj has uh, first-hand knowledge of the problems of uh, financing of uh, SMEs. He has been pursuing the problems of SMEs with the central and state governments for a long time. More recently, he has been assisting the Commonwealth Secretariat in a project on global value chain. So, Mr. Bhardwaj, you have the floor. Oh, thank you, sir. <coughs> Uh, Chairman uh, Professor Huda, Professor Yoshino, Professor Prem Chandra, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I first of all thank you RIS for uh, giving me this opportunity and I uh, congratulate them for taking the thought leadership for organizing this very, very important program on global value chains. My brief intervention uh, would cover four aspects. One. I'll share some observations I have on the change and how the GBCs are transforming the traditional industrial and trade policies. Two, we'll try to see some of the key elements and try to focus them. Third, we try to see that what are the opportunities for India in GBCs. And fourthly, the specific task that is uh, for this session that uh, challenges that would be there for SMEs uh, in financing, especially in the context of GVCs. You have been participating for last uh, uh, one day and you, have, you must have noticed that the competitive advantage as understood in the traditional sense has really changed from product it has shifted to activities and tasks. So if some country is exporting a product and uh, it was seen that you know this particular country may be 
more competitive in producing the product. This conventional wisdom holds no more. We have to see that how much value is being added while it is exporting and where this value is being added, whether this value is being added in the country that is exporting or it is in the backward value chain or it is in the forward value chain. So therefore, suddenly the emphasis has to be there or the gauge has to shift to the intermediate products and services. At the same time, the entire exports policy framework also will have to undergo a huge change because currently it is focused to exports. We have export promotion councils targeting product exports, but unless we look at the entire value chain, it would be very difficult that how we can make the value addition happen in, in a particular country. We are already aware, I think I'm sure that you know yesterday somebody must have mentioned to you this smiley curve or people who are participating in GVCs or discussing, where it is seen that the maximum, for example, a loaf of bread. The loaf of bread, the, the percentage of manufacturing component in a loaf of bread that we consume daily is less than 20%. 80% of now it is services. And the services component is a spread at so many places. So each product is to be seen in the context of the value chain. Similarly, as we see while we are doing our elementary mathematics, that for a particular digit, that what is its place value. Similarly, for every product, we have to see what is its place value in the entire value chain. Its backward part and the forward part. Secondly, when it comes to the governance of global value chains, we could very easily notice that maximum power is being uh, utilized or is used or is concentrated around nodes that derive the highest part of the technology. So maximum concentration of technology in a particular value chain, it is there that value addition is also maximum there. The case of iPad is before all of us. iPad is exported almost entirely from China, but its value addition there or in <coughs> $150 product, less than $4 is appropriated by China. Almost 40% of it goes exclusively to Apple, which has designed, provided the technology, is responsible for quality, quality assurance, is responsible for managing the entire value chain, or so to say, governing the entire value chain. Naturally, in such a context, our traditional sense of policy will have to change. And our emphasis has to be there then on both the non-policy measures as well as the policy measures. Policy measures being the trade policy and FDI. And it has to be seen that how, for example, it would allow easy import and easy export of products and intermediaries. We also have to see that we do not disrupt this chain by having a tariff structure, which is inward looking or not inward looking, I would say, has uh, inverted tariff escalation. It should not have inverted tariff at all. Otherwise, it would disrupt the value chain. Similarly, on the non-policy measures, uh, important elements that are there are market size and uh, location, the level of development of a country at a particular moment. If you look at this perspective, both from the policy and non-policy measures, I would say that India is a very, very interesting place in the context of global value chain. We are almost there. We are almost there. If we do a little bit of things right at the right places, in infrastructure a bit, in input supply a bit, policy measures a bit, we are almost there because of the market size, because of the location, <coughs> also because of a wide and vibrant segment of SMEs. So it, when we look at this, I find that, you know, uh, those value chains could be very interesting where we have high tech component of it and we also have potential of uh, high labor intensity, a combination of these two. To give an example, say power transformers, so electrical equipment. Now power transformer, for example, has more than 1,000 products. It's a stationary product, simple product, but it's a part of a huge and important supply chain. It has high tech component in terms of design, 
Its design is the critical. Each transformer is designed specifically for a specific product, for a specific purpose and use. At the same time, it has a lot of uh, labor intensity, intensity because the winding is still done by hand. Bulk of the winding is still being done by hand. So it's an intensive labor component as well as it has high tech component and both can be done, for example, in this country. Such a product could be an interesting product to be part of a forward supply chain. The problem in the forward supply chain part. For this product to be acceptable or to be become part of the supply chain, we have to see how it is consumed in the work mar world market. It is consumed in two ways. One is through tendering business, and two, more importantly, increasingly, through EPCs or EPC contractors who take entire uh, contract of, I mean, uh, including, say, substation. So that would include establishing uh, the transformer, the switch gear, and uh, other paraphernalia that is required. It has civil construction and so on and so forth. But there, if you want to supply to EPCs, you have to see that you have to give credit. You have to give suppliers credit. But if you want to give suppliers credit from India, it is almost impossible for an MS MSME. Even in our uh, export, uh, uh, Exim Bank is, has not really, uh, uh, you can say, arrive to a level where it can appreciate the complexity of participation uh, by SMEs in a supply chain or in a value chain, like say electricals. So here, interestingly, you'd be surprised that unlike many other countries, our ex uh, Exim Bank, say would be giving LIBOR plus 4% and would be charging from uh, the importer, the buyer and would also be charging some percentage, including from 1% to 2% from the Indian supplier. This is very strange, but this is how it is. And the reason is that they cannot really still fathom that you know how much important it is for a particular product to become competitive in a global value chain. Similar product could be, uh, large number of such products are there in uh, mechatronics, uh, other electrical equipment, embedded systems, where you both have the high-tech part, as well as the labor-intensity part. When you want to upgrade or you can say part, uh, become part of the supply chain, you have to enter in either the four ways. Uh, Professor Prem Chandra has given you some example, but uh, like you know whether you enter through the process upgradation or through product uh, upgradation, functional upgradation, or chain upgradation, these are the four areas. But if you look at the one of the interesting fact is that you know, uh, you need greater risk capital at each stage. Starting at the lowest level at the process upgradation, whatever you're doing, little bit of change is required, so you put investment in it, little risk capital is required. You go to the product. Developing a product would require addition in the value chains. Uh, the, risk the intensity of risk capital would increase. So finally, I would say that in financial terms, the worst, first, one of the most important aspect is that how you have to be uh, competitive or your return on investment would not be, uh, that would give you an idea that you should invest uh, money because the return on investment would be low vis-a-vis -vis the interest rate that would be charged by the banks. So with that, I, I conclude uh, that it is extremely important and I'll also add to the financing, sir, one, the part of the insurance. Increasingly in the global value chains, uh, the risk of product not performing is also spread across the value chain. But we also have to see that our insurance sector gears up to developing those insurance products that MSMEs can participate in uh, global value chain. For example, if you're supplying an auto part and component to a uh, global brand, and if something, some recalls take place later two, two to three years down the line, then who bears the cost? So in, in our case, unless you have the product insurance, most of the Indian companies are not yet uh, uh, providing or have not been providing. It's only re very recently that Tata and one more company has started providing it in a very, very small scale. So I mean to say that financial system as a whole will have to gear up to aid and support MSMEs so that they can also become part of supply chain, both the financial part, non-fund based, as well as the insurance. Thank you very much.
thank you, uh, Mr. Bhardwaj. I was wondering whether uh, you may like to touch, uh, because we have a couple of minutes uh, I can give to you. I would like to touch uh, on uh, the efforts that the government of India has uh, made <coughs> in order to improve uh, access to credit for SMEs and the gaps that uh, you feel uh, that are still there. Uh, thanks for your generosity, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor, you should, you should have mentioned about Credit Guarantee Corporation. So in India, uh, we also, uh, Government of India started uh, Credit Guarantee, CGT MSE. And the difference being that it, where uh, Professor mentioned that in Japan, almost 80% of MSMEs while accessing loans will go through this route of credit guarantee. In the case of India, it is less than 5%. This is one difference. And uh, I mean, a lot of financial equity infusion from the government would be required to make it I mean, larger. There are a number of uh, interesting uh, experiments are being done. For example, in Malaysia, what they're doing is that instead of uh, uh, for example, typically what happens is if you want to take a loan, you go to the bank, the bank appraises your project, would take the guarantee cover, uh, give go or no go, and finance you. In case of Malaysia, what they have done is they have tried to uh, invert this whole process, and they said instead of going to the bank, let an SME go to a credit guarantee institution. And the credit guarantee institution first analyzes the risk and develops, or you can say, aids or assists in developing the project report and gives the guarantee first hand. So after getting the guarantee, then you do bank shopping. You go to one bank, to other bank, and say that you already, my project is appraised by Credit Guarantee Corporation. It is already covered by this. Now, what is the minimum rate of interest you would like to offer it to me? So such competition they have been able to uh, induce. In India, I think this is one important initiative, but I think that needs to be uh, expanded and more equity infusion would be required. <coughs> the second important uh, uh, policy that we have in India, uh, which I think is not there in many developing countries, that uh, we have a system of priority sector lending, that you know, certain percentage of our total bank lending has to go to certain priority sector, which also includes micro and small enterprises. Uh, that excludes, by the way, medium enterprises. Although uh, the, the jury is still out, it is not uh, clear that, you know, whether it has benefited more or it has also, in some sense, uh, created a kind of uh, entitlement to, to some sectors. And banks have become rather lazy and they have rather uh, they would fill this uh, criteria and after that they would not be making much efforts. But some interesting uh, interventions are on cards and some have already been done. One is that, you know, government of India realizing that, you know, the biggest problem that is faced by uh, enterprises is in the micro segment, especially up to the loan segment of 50 lakh of rupees, zero to 50 lakh. So that's why they have come out with the concept of Mudra Bank. And the Mudra Bank is, uh, is trying to finance smaller of uh, the small, uh, typically self-employed microenterprises. Uh, it is above the segment of the microfinance loans, uh, which are served by microfinancing institutions, typically like uh, uh, the MFIs, and not covered by the bank sector. So it's a middle, uh, missing middle segment that through Mudra Bank they are trying to address. Another important initiative uh, which will have a huge fallout is uh, through the payment banks because that is to infuse enormous liquidity in the system and that uh, large amount of money would be channelized uh, in the financial system which currently is almost a monopoly of banks and that I think is going to be a game changer for micro, small, and medium enterprises, particularly the smaller enterprises. So these are some important initiatives, but I think uh, we, we need to do uh, a lot of catching up to do, especially in risk capital. Getting money to start a business, especially if it's a risky business, it is extremely difficult. And uh, when we are talking about uh, global value chains, that I think is going to become critical. Thank you. Let me now open the floor for uh, 
uh, general discussion. So who would like to, I think at the back I saw the first, so first yourself, then here, then two other hands, and then two more here. I have now almost seven speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. Man Please Paul. introduce Man yourself. Paul. Yes. Man Paul from Delhi University teaches finance. I think it's a very interesting, you know, uh, my point is related to the second speaker, economist from ADV. I think he, in his first part, he talks about uh, creditworthiness of borrower. I think it is a standard 